I first met our next speaker and his lovely wife, Penny, way back in the last decade of the last century. If that sounds like a long time ago, it is. It was. Uh, at the time, I was studying for my PhD in political science at the Claremont Graduate School, and he was the president of the Claremont Institute. And what I quickly learned about him is something Hill Hillsdale students today learn about him, and that's uh, the fact that he's a teacher. He's always teaching. Uh, he didn't teach formal classes back then, but he always took the time to talk to us uh, graduate students. Uh, and by the way, last night I mentioned his love of tennis. His, te his love of teaching extended to the tennis court. Uh, we used to play with some regularity back in those uh, long ago days. He was well skilled in the fundamentals of the game and he loved to teach those fundamentals. Now what that meant in practice is that not only would he uh, trounce you on the court, he would, afterwards he would explain exactly how uh, he trounced you. <laughs> well, I would encourage you to come and see us on the Hillsdale campus uh, and what you'll see is he hasn't changed a bit. He still, uh, he still loves to teach and now he's doing it in the classroom. He offers courses on a variety of subjects, including Aristotle, the Constitution, C.S. Lewis, and totalitarian novels. It's been my privilege uh, to work with him at my alma mater for the past uh, now more than 20 years. Uh, please welcome back to the podium the 12th president of Hillsdale College, Larry Piarn. I thought Mark Stein was going to end up being given the best speech at this thing, but now there's doubt. <laughs> uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going to excuse myself after lunch because I'm having lunch with the governor. And, uh, <laughs> and that's happening because I'm a really important guy. It's, uh, uh, that's happening because he's, want, he's, he's wanting to save the country and he wants charter schools and we know a lot about that. And uh, and uh, I've had a new thought in the last month that I'll tell you about. Uh, for some reason, we have education centers popping up all over the place and we didn't really plan them. Well, we did the one in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. We got a graduate school there and a lot going on there. But there's one in Summers, Connecticut now. That's on the Massachusetts border. Have you heard about that? It was given to us by the founder and builder of Friendly Ice Cream. And uh, it's a beautiful property, and it has an exact replica of Monticello on it. And I thought... Okay, and he called up and said, I'm gonna give you this property and I'm gonna give you $25 million in endowment to take care of it. And, <laughs> I looked around for a minute, couldn't think of a reason to say no. <laughs> uh, now there's something like that in California, maybe two things. And then the other day I was reading about our governor in Michigan and, uh, and I thought, you know, California, Connecticut, Michigan, we need to go to a red state. <laughs> so we may, I'm going to talk to the governor about, uh, and see, it'll be a great conversation for him because I'm confident other governors have done this when I bring it up. Well, we'll help you. Christy, Christy Nome asked offered to build us an entire campus in South Dakota. And, and I said, uh, Governor, we don't take any money from you. We can't, we can't do that. She said, well, maybe I could raise it. And I said, maybe, I said, but that would be, you know, a lot. So I don't want anything from the governor except to talk to him about it and uh, ask him to anticipate what's going to happen. And I'll tell you what we're going to do in these education cities centers. Uh, we now have accumulated registered online students above three and a half million. Um, we have uh, 26 charter schools and eight more opening in the next 18 months. Um, 
Uh, we've got curricula and we've got schools that we advise in the running of and we have hundreds of teachers come to our campus in the, in the summer and we're getting to know a lot about that. And uh, so we're gonna open a homeschool division. And, uh, Uh, we're going to do online courses for credit. Uh, you know, it means you'll actually have to study. <laughs> and uh, and uh, first, dual enrollment courses. Uh, we're going to start a master's degree program in classical education pretty soon, I think, so that we can staff these schools because the great bottleneck is headmasters and after that, uh, teachers. And you know, a teaching, teaching is a very high calling. And they're not trained that way anymore, and that's too bad. Uh, so these education centers will be where those people can come somewhere local and do in person, like this, sort of. And uh, so it's a grand adventure, and uh, that's why I won't be here at lunch today. Um, now, this crisis that we're in, that's a good segue into that, right? Because this is the most serious kind of thing, in my opinion. Um, how do we understand it? What is it? And then what do we do about it? And I'll mention some examples from the past that give hope. Uh, think of the resources that are gathered by the ruling class, because that, that's what they are now. Um, The institutions in which we learn, starting with the most elite ones where the fancy pants people are trained, um, they are in almost entirely woke now. Uh, Williams College, I have a friend there, teaches in political science, and he wrote an article in Arrow Magazine, what, the woke movement at Williams College, you can look it up, a Arrow is A-E-R-O, it's free online. It's a terrifying thing. Basically, school has stopped happening because everybody's afraid to say anything. Uh, but that's just at the top because the, you know, the, the staple university in America today is of two kinds. I mean, the modal type, the one that's most common. It's either a... Uh, second or third tier state university where almost everybody goes to college now, or else it's a broke liberal arts college. And you know, uh, I think Forbes says there are 963 of those and that uh, maybe 30% of them are in some kind of imminent trouble. And what happens at those state universities is that they're clones of the most elite to the best of their ability, and very common that is. It's the third tier ones, and second tier ones some, that train the teachers, and, uh, and they are teaching them all the rightest stuff, and they're heavily under the influence of the state education bureaucracy in every state, which is, by the way, more than half the budget in every state. Um, and, and I'll mention about that, that uh, in the public schools in America, this is a shocking fact and nobody talks about it. Did you know that more than half the employees in public education today are not teachers? <laughs> do, you, do you know what the number is in a charter school? It's about six teachers for every uh, non-teaching employee. So first of all, more than half the budget never gets anywhere near the school. And what do those people do? Well, they're, they design what's to be taught. You know, like that needs to be done, by the way. I mean, if the one in this room who knows the least about it set out honestly to construct a basic curriculum along the long established lines, you would do it more or less successfully in about a month. It's not that hard, right? Human beings grow up at about the same rate they always did. They need to know the same things. They need to be good at the human skills, reading, writing, and arithmetic. 
They need natural history, natural science, and the story of human beings in literature and philosophy and history. And then you've done it, right? That's everything. But no, constantly inventing new ways to teach them to read, for example. Whereas in our charter schools and our Hillsdale Academy, we've never graduated a kindergartner who couldn't read. And the reason is they can already read. I mean, in principle, because, you know, my granddaughter that makes me pity you, um, she's already teaching herself to talk, right? And she's, you know, she's gonna be like her mother. She's never gonna shut up. But then once you talk, because what happens when you talk? You know, you say, uh, glasses. There are many pairs of glasses, right? And we don't look at, at cue cards or flash cards to learn what that is or to see a whole variety of them, right? We just look at it and we can see the essence of it, right? And, the, and then that word, glasses, that's the equivalent of the mark that's on a page, G-L-A-S-S-E-S. Right? And so all you gotta do, the reason it works is because they've already taught themselves the sounds. That's why phonics works, right? Just apply phonics to the marks on the page. And the point is, a lot of them just discover that for themselves, by the way. But even if they don't, just teach them what the sounds are. They go with these letters. And you know what else, I can't do it, but I, was, I actually did do phonics in elementary school and that was in the late 17th century. <laughs> so the point is, there's a huge load in this. And by the way, their opinions tend to be opinions that would justify their existence. You see, like a history teacher or a science teacher or a lit teacher, they'll be doing that because they think that those subjects are important and they love them. Whereas if you're a regulator of education, you're bound to think education needs a lot of regulating. And, and what's wrong, by the way, with that idea, I said it this morning to the first timers, if you become a teacher, I mean, it's just a, you know, I didn't do it until I was 47. My father was a high school teacher in Arkansas. Uh, and I just, you know, he was a wonderful man and he found his happiness doing that, never made any money. But I started doing it when I decided to go into the college business. And I, my first job in the college is, in a college is the one I've got today. And I started teaching. And a great truth that I knew only in principle was born in upon me. And that is, you don't teach them, they learn. You just help them. And if you explain to them the most beautiful thing you know, something that might have taken you years of devotion and love to learn. If you don't do it in the right way, you'll just bore the heck out of them. And the way not to do that is to ask them before you tell them. It's good to tell them why this might be important, but what is that thing? That's Socrates' question. That's, he's always asking, T-S-D, what is? What is this? What is that? Right? Well, Education is this control of a vast engine that obscures that fact and therefore dehumanizes the kids in a more general and less intense way than making them transgender when they're too young to decide. Now, large parts of the way we gather and report information is in concentrated hands an element, I think, of this ruling class. I think that what college professors have done, because you know, being a college professor is, uh, it ain't sexy by today's terms, right? They, they uh, I can tell you what they're, I've, in, I've interviewed more than 450 people for faculty jobs in 21 years. I just love it. I just, I, I, I've just learned to respect them so deeply. And here's the thing. They're all used to being among the smartest people they ever met. <laughs> they are, you know? And, uh, you know, and, and they could go to law school or med school and there'd be a guaranteed path to a big income. And they don't. They get three times as much education and they're gonna make a third as much. 
Now, why did they make that choice? The good ones, and it's the ones at Hillsdale are good. There's a love. They love. They want to know. And, and they too, see, they carry their excellence inside themselves. There's a fire that burns in them to get them all that way. And then they want to teach. Well, the trouble is you'll never get rich. And you don't really get to tell anybody adult what to do. So what if, and this is the great engineering project that was born in the progressive era in American universities, it came from Germany. We could be the ones who would plan the future of society. Now we will rule. You see, we'll be important, we'll be powerful. I once stayed in the suburbs outside uh, Washington, D.C., and went in on the metro. Uh, and I just looked who was there. And uh, I recognized a couple of people, and I asked a couple of others who they were, and they were academics going in to decide what the government was going to do today. And that's, you know, kind of intoxicating and strong. Men of affairs, men and women of affairs, right? So they, they dominate journalism now. And see, journalists are just like college professors because what they used to be was servants of the truth. That speech that we just heard, it was, uh, I just invited Abigail to come and teach because it was disciplined. And what was it disciplined to? the facts as she has seen them. And in the course of it, she named a whole bunch of things that were curious to me, but sounded very plausible. Like, for example, there are a lot of people who have gender dysphoria. And I've never doubted that, and I've never doubted they shouldn't have help, but it's possible that this could even be help to some people. And you shouldn't begrudge that, right? And that means that she followed what she saw and that means she's not master of the universe. She's just beholding it, right? And this new temper is better. It's all a contest for power. And journalists today, they go look at things and they report them. That's what they're supposed to do, right? And they have to struggle to do it objectively and they gotta take care. It's just like the scholar's art, except it's stuff that's moving every day, right? Well, what if instead they get to decide who's the next president of the United States? That's a cool station. If you read in the uh, Washington Post really writes these the most, if you read the stories about who gets to go to the White House press conference, you can tell the high journalists think they own that space. Right? That's our space. You see? And they're the media. They're between us and something. And we can't have direct access to that something. That's, that's the phenomenon, right? And uh, I liked it that Trump would pick nobodies to come in there. It really ticked them off, see? <laughs> but that, that space, right? That's the space that belongs to the American people. And it's reserved for the person they elect to be the chief executive. But no, these guys own that space now. It's like a bigger deal. Power. The major corporations. Do you know those, uh, this stuff that went on in the last few months, and it's going on all the time, uh, you know, threatening this state, for example, right now, about a transgender law. Well, a few, two years ago, I think it was, Bezos and Tim Cook and the whole gang, you know, who they, they actually have more money than everybody else if you include their money in that. And they decided that they would renounce what was called the Friedman Rule from Milton Friedman. And the Friedman Rule was the assets of a public corporation belong to the shareholders, and they should be used for the purpose of advancing an, uh, shareholder value. And if they want to give to charity, give their own money. And give the, give the charity money back to the, to the shareholders, and they, they just specifically renounced that. And that means what they were saying in the plainest language was, we're going to take other people's money now, and we're going to decide how to affect the society. Power, you see, power. I think Steve Jobs is probably a great man, 
and I think the ones who follow him are not so great, but one of the reasons was he always thought he was conforming to the demands of beauty and utility in making his products. And he was very disciplined about that, right? Well, that means that all acts of creativity of high worth are also acts of obedience. It's obedience we don't like anymore. We like to tell people what to do. You know that obedience was one of Winston Churchill's favorite words? He, he, was, he always thought he was obeying. That's why he was so stubborn. <laughs> then there's the regulatory state. And that's 24 million people, most of them at the state level, but it's very much a system that, in, that uh, influences from the top down. And they're a, a class of person, and they're not what they used to be. Church, Churchill said that famous thing once, no longer civil and no longer servants. <laughs> well, there, there's that going on. You know, in the early progressive era, R.J. Pastrito publishes about, about that. He's the dean of our graduate school in the politics department. Uh, they thought that separation of powers was no longer needed because now there's gonna be a class of person working in the government who will have a guaranteed salary that cannot be reduced It'll be enough to support them, and they'll have tenure in office forever. And that means they won't have any needs or interest, and so they won't pursue their needs and interest in politics. If you look at a list of the 10 biggest givers in politics today, in partisan elections all on one side, the public and union, employee unions are tops. Because they're people too, and they have interest, and they like a world in which people like them decide things, and in the name not of consent, the popular thing, in the name of science. You see, I mean, the pandemic is the craziest thing in the world to me because when you know we decided we were going to have college, you know, up to the point of threat of arrest, which I've had, and uh, and. So, but you know, I didn't want to do that recklessly. As I tell the students, if you get sick and die, although we can get more, it would be very, it'll be very inconvenient to me. And so, and so, and so, I say that all the time. You know, it's a weird thing at Hillsdale College. The mothers like that. They're, they're like Spartan women, you know. Anyway, I didn't want them to die. Disrupt the schedule. And, uh, <laughs> and so I tried to find out, and we found ourselves in association with some people that I think are just geniuses. Jay Bhattacharya, Scott Atlas, Daniel Halperin. Um, <laughs> and so, and, and you know, then after that it's easy, right? Because I have to obey the law if they actually make a law although what they make now is memos from the governor. And that's not really how a law gets made, you know. Uh, and those can be challenged in court, and we are ready to do it. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I tell you this, my, uh, we have these doctors from the Mayo Clinic, and uh, the Mayo Clinic is very cautious about the coronavirus. And they're worried about the long-term effects and all that. And, uh, and you, know, they don't, you know, they always say, are you worried about the long-term effects? And I said, no, I'm busy, I got a lot to do. <laughs> I said, but anyway, we can't know that, right? I mean, it's exactly like the point made earlier about reversibility of some of these things. Well, it hadn't been long enough to know, right? Well, anyway, one of them was kind of critical of me. Well, he's a friend, but you know, he said, well, you, you really picked the experts that were for opening up. And I said, sure. And he said, oh, he, did. he was surprised I'd admit that. And I said, look, Doc, are you guys the tops in the world at the Mayo Clinic? And he said, well, we're pretty good. And I said, how about these guys at Stanford? Are they okay? Expert knowledge. This ruling class operates in the name of expertise. And that's a different title to rule than consent. 
the consent of equal souls. And this expertise has got to be strictly limited. As Winston Churchill explained, expert knowledge is narrow knowledge. You know, imagine one of those sets of parents and the kid comes under this gender thing. What are you gonna do? That's a really hard decision, right? Because you're gonna stand up to a lot of people and they're powerful and they might take your kid or you're gonna leave the kid there and try to cope with it. There's no good answer to that question, but nobody is better qualified to make the judgment than a mother. Uh, Churchill, there's a, so one, I'm gonna give you some instances where things have been like this, where everything was at stake and we might lose our freedom. Uh, and one of them is in 1948, 1945 to 1951, uh, after the Second World War, the socialists came in, big majority. And they're not, they're not like these guys that we've got today. They had been announcing for 50 years what they were going to do, and then they won a big majority. And Churchill always said that it would be the death of civilization and freedom, but by golly, they're entitled to do it. And so what we're gonna do is complain about it and then reverse it later. And, and he, he, uh, his campaign, this is the key thing that I'm gonna to say today. From 1945 to 1952, Winston Churchill led the Conservative Party on a campaign against socialism under the title, Socialism Versus the People. You see? And he would point out to them that practical decisions always involve a hundred factors then, and we, by the way, we make them every day, every one of us. There's no more intense or practical or consequential decision than how to raise your kid. Well, Mr. Douglas J. of the Home Office in the Attlee Socialist Administration said a famous thing, and it echoes now, if you know anything about British history, you'll, modern British history, you'll know this. He said, uh, mothers, do not always understand how to feed their children. The gentleman in Whitehall, that's the governing center of Britain, the gentleman in Whitehall know better. <laughs> and he made the terrible mistake of saying that in the hearing of Winston Churchill. <laughs> and Churchill rang the changes on that, but you see what that means? This, I, just, I just named a four-part vast apparatus that is working together and that controls directly and indirectly more than half of the economy in the United States and Europe, right? That is a, a formidable force. It's huge. And how are you gonna stop it? And it's proceeding under the, under the principle that you can't teach a kid to read without expertise, you know, which is stupid. Because, you know, first of all, a lot of them learn to read on their own. And so that's the point. That's, by the way, why it will eventually become ugly and despotic, despite kind intentions. Because this is the thing that has to justify itself. And it's furiously at work on that all the time. This happened in 1776. In 1860, in 1945 in Britain, and in 1979 in Britain. Uh, things were as bad as this in all those occasions. Now, I'm not gonna talk a lot about Russia in 1917 because that's a counterexample. In other words, the Russian Revolution succeeded. And it succeeded by heartbreakingly narrow margins and the lives of 100 million people were at stake, and they lost their lives because of that. Well, world communism, Russia was not as good at killing as China. It was maybe 35 million in Russia. And, you know, so that's a sad one, right? But those won the American Revolution, the Civil War, the rise of Margaret Thatcher in Britain, 
And the post-war Churchill, only time he was, he became prime minister in 1951, and his combat against socialism, which by the way, that 1951 to 55 administration got rid of part of socialism, and Margaret Thatcher got rid of the, last, the rest. And I'll tell you what those things have in common. Um, first of all, a movement started. Notice how many people are in this room, right? People, last night, people would say, but the American people uh, accept this now. Why is there no movement against it? And to both of them, I said, look around. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm telling you, we, we at the college, whatever line of operation we're in, admissions, faculty hiring, events, charter schools, online students, we can't beat them off with a stick. And that's, you know, it makes a person optimistic when he sees that. Uh, especially when he sees, you know, because we have, we have this big national mess that we've made, but it all radiates from a tight little world that we're all in, and we get to measure the effects of what we do and say before our eyes every day. It's just so fine and such a grand thing to be able to do. And, uh, and it helps a lot, it makes us better, we think. So this, there's a movement. And you know, the, 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 the next part is uh, greatness. Uh, some great leader. And that's extremely unpredictable. It's in, uh, in the classic works, uh, statesmanship, which is a form of art, a very difficult form of human making or art, is understood as a synonym for chance. In Churchill's writing, very often, because you know chance is, uh, is the intersection of two causes that produce a third result that neither of them would have produced on its own. Uh, and two independent causes, right? So if you, you know, if, Snow gets on the branch, the branch breaks off. That's nature. Saw off the branch, that's art. Saw off the branch on the top of the head of somebody standing below, that's either chance or a misdemeanor. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and so wh why would you think that these extremely rare and artful people would also be chance? Well, the reason is, can't control when they show up, and sometimes you really need them. Now would be good. But they didn't make the movements. Those started because people saw something, and it disturbed them. Nobody was worried about Great Britain before 1763 in America, but then the, they, won the, they won the big war with France, and they've got this whacking big empire, and it just comes to them, maybe we ought to use it. And then just so happens over there, they had a terrible failure of statesmanship because the great men in Britain at that time, uh, Edmund Burke and William Pitt, were friends of the American Revolution. No, they were governed by Lord North, who was an idiot. And, and that may, but you know, they started doing things to people who'd been governing themselves for 150 years, right? And they didn't like it. And then there was a kind of a, Igniter. Uh, Tom Paine wrote Common Sense. Before that, George Whitfield, who's the greatest preacher probably, he was the Billy, Billy Graham of the 18th century, uh, and he would get 30,000 people to come and hear him preach. And he was preaching about faith, but also freedom. And he became big friends with uh, Ben Franklin, who was not particularly orthodox in his Christian views. And they became friends because Ben Franklin went and he said, no way he can talk to 30,000 people. And so he went and stood by the stage and he walked away and counted his paces until he could just barely hear him, but could hear him. And then he measured, you know, Ben Franklin was kind of a lunatic. I mean, a very great man, but you know, he was very meticulous. He uh, measured the space. And how many people could stand in the space? 30,000. Now, 
those things were sort of catalysts or igniters. But then somebody came along to guide all of that. And you know, don't think that the situation is more difficult now than it was in 1776. A people who had never had an army, never had a government of their own, were about to make war on the greatest power on earth. In 1860, uh, people say uh, to me sometimes, uh, we could never have a great revival like we had in 1860, 1858 to 1860, because people don't pay attention to politics. 30,000 people came to listen to the Lincoln-Douglas debates, and I urge you to read them. They're, they're sublime. Uh, Douglas is very artful and very powerful. Lincoln is sublime, and he destroyed Douglas. And yeah, 30,000 people, they went on three and a half, four hours, each one. There were eight of them. And then they came on their horses, and they sat in the sun. And they say, you know, people haven't done that since. Well, I said, you know, they never did that before either. But something important was going on, right? This slavery thing was extremely troubling. And from every point of view, the, the, the wicked ones who thought that they deserved to own the slaves, they were afraid they were going to lose it. But really what they were afraid of is they couldn't expand it. And others, for a mixture of reasons, the, the sublime of which is equality and freedom, but also mixed around that we don't really want a lot of black people in this state. And that's the cauldron that Abraham Lincoln stood up, and he was a shabby lawyer. Everybody thought he was a hobo when they first saw him. And uh, Fred, uh, Stephen Douglas, dressed in ruffled shirts and uh, had matched horses on his carriage. He just liked, looked like the aristocracy coming to town. And, and see, people listen to those arguments. That's happening more and more. Uh, in in uh, 1948, Churchill raised that campaign. And you know, he was a one-man wrecking ball in the House of Commons. He could just do amazing things. He, he, by himself, built the movement that got Britain to rearm just barely enough to survive 1940. And at first, he had five or six backbenchers who were in disrepute, and they were the only ones who'd listen to him. But he was very good at what he did. And the people, you see, he, 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 uh, people kept writing him. He started a group called The Focus. And the purpose of it was, we're not going to fight with each other about anything else. We're going to unite. I mean, we can be socialist, and we can be capitalist, we can be whatever. We're going to agree that we have to stop Adolf Hitler from conquering Great Britain. That's all. Well, there were hundreds of thousands of people in that thing. And it just grew from nowhere. It got no help from the BBC. Because just remember what I said about learning to read and about teaching? The salvation of the United States of America is in each citizen. And we're going to find out if they're still Americans. And if they're not, it's already over. But I think they are. And they are going to produce the conditions for a turnaround, or else those conditions won't be produced. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, I, I happened to be living there at the time. Uh, I, I, I went over there to get my girl. And uh, <laughs> by the way, I was very relieved that it's rare for women in their 50s and 60s to go transgender. <laughs> I've been I told Penny that, and she said, we should ask her about men. <laughs> uh, I, I was working on the official biography of Winston Churchill. And you know, that was great. But then Margaret Thatcher became the leader of the Conservative Party and then Prime Minister in 1979, right in the middle of the time that I was living there with my soon-to-be missus. And it was just the most thrilling thing you ever saw. It was like, you know, I like tennis, and so we were there, and we'd watch Wimbledon on TV. That was the McEnroe versus Borg years. Uh, and this was better. 
Margaret Thatcher arguing with uh, James Callahan, the socialist prime minister. And she was taken, the, the way the, the, the ad adjective they used for her was shrill. She's shrill, right? Well, she's a woman, you know, she didn't sound like a man. But Lord, what she wasn't was shrill. She was tough. And, uh, and then she broke him down. Every year, every, and you know, he, by the way, was the last great taunter of Winston Churchill early in Callahan's career and late in Churchill's career. And uh, so he's pretty formidable, right? And she took him down and broke him. And then what was their situation? It's as bad as this. First of all, the Labor Party had a majority and they were ruled by the Trade Unions Council, a majority of whom were open members of the Communist Party. And then these, these labor unions were extremely strong and they would shut down parts of the, of the country. If you, they'd make a demand, very often on the government because there were still some socialized, the railroads and the phone company and some of those. And, and they'd just demand what they wanted and then in the winter, they'd stop communication, couldn't get milk. And they would uh, picket not only a company they were in dispute with, it was picketing private people, the government, everybody, but they'd pick their, they'd picket their customers and suppliers too, called secondary picketing. And uh, Edward Heath, who was a weenie, who was elected <laughs> prime minister before Margaret Thatcher, he had promised to stop this. If he got a majority, he got a majority and he didn't stop it. And he gave in to the unions in the middle of the winter. People were getting cold. So she says she won't do that, right? And she gets elected, and I can remember the day, I was watching the news, because you know, they had shut down a part of Yorkshire up in the north. Uh, you know, part of the city of York, a region, an area of it where there was an industry and a lot of different companies working together. And they just closed the whole thing down and the city wasn't working. And the BBC is there reporting and then, uh, and then uh, the, the, the reporter heard something and he looked and he said, oh, there's a convoy coming. And it was buses and trucks. And what was in the buses was London cops. And what was in the trucks was portable fencing. And they elected about, they arrested about 5,000 people. <laughs> and they put them in these fences they built. And then that was over. And then the next day, the, uh, uh, the BBC was showing guys in dark suits and briefcases going to union offices to seize their assets. And you know, by five o'clock the next day, there were negotiations going on <laughs> about this. And that, you know, she was just, she, she is the, the firmest example of executive action I've seen with my own eyes. Not more firm. I, you know, I was privileged to know her pretty well. And I was privileged to know Ronald Reagan. And I always say to him, Mr. President, because I was sometimes critical of him, to him. And uh, I, I'd say to him, Mr. President, you're the greatest man I ever met. And he would remember and say, yeah, but you think Margaret's greater. And I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> What's to happen today? Well, it, 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 both options, just like in all of these crises I've named, remember, there was a movement and there was somebody to guide and lead it and it became clear and it was fought through, sometimes with violence, sometimes not. Well, once you see that that's a kind of pattern, that's what's happened in the past, first of all, you understand this is very formidable. Because for most of the American Revolution and most of the Civil War, most of the Second World War, different kind of crisis, but by the way, similar forces, uh, the people who eventually won couldn't imagine that they could win. They thought they were fighting to the death, you see. And that means that we may have to undergo that. But we should take comfort from things like this because and this is my final point. Freedom is a beautiful thing. The 
Constitution of the United States is a beautiful thing. The Declaration of Independence is the most beautiful political document ever written. And in the first line of Aristotle's ethics, he says that every choice we make and every action we take and every inquiry we, go, we take all seem to aim at some good. And the highest form of the good is the beautiful. We all long for that. These things that they're doing now, they're dangerous because they parade in the name of the beautiful. But if they're not beautiful, that can't last. And that means just like in every kid, there's the potential to breathe. In every human breast, there's the potential to fight for freedom. The thing to do now is to communicate to everyone you know. Learn, get better, teach. Don't make yourself a nuisance. Well, later that might be right. <laughs> Duh. You know, you can't, one of the iron rules in excellent education is you can't teach people who don't want to learn. Because it's hard for them, you know? And that means don't annoy people. Make it easy. If you see something lovely and you want people to read, send it to some people. And say, you probably don't have time to read this, but I found it good, right? And then you're not challenging them. You know, I, I, get, uh, I get a lot of recommendations like that. And sometimes with the challenge, sometimes people write, well, if you're really serious about your job, then, you know. <laughs> And I usually write back, I'm not. <laughs> so, but see, just like it's true, you know, the thing about a despotic movement, they always know who their numbers are because everybody's sort of bought and paid for. Whereas a free movement, it's of infinite size, as many as there are people. When Abraham Lincoln called for 75,000 troops in March of 1861, he didn't know if they'd come. He did know that there was a hostile army that almost had the capital surrounding, surrounded, and if Maryland seceded, and it was about to, then Washington, D.C. would be encircled. He knew that, and he didn't know if there could be any help. Well, that's where we are, too, remember, because we're on the free side. And that means people who are free will join us or else they will not. Let's get them to. Thank you. Now, I want to tell those of you in the front that many of those people in the back were standing up and you were not. If you didn't like my speech, get out. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Arn. We now have time for a few questions. If you would like to ask a question, please come find your way to a microphone. Question to the speaker's left. Dr. Arn, thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, we are first timers. We're so glad to be here. And I'm so glad you mentioned Mrs. Thatcher and President Reagan. Um, last week I started to use one of his quotes as my <clears throat> new signature block. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> See, what I, you know, the two great talks we've ta uh, heard so far had many things in common. And one of the best was, speak your peace, right? This, not wanting to be rude, you shouldn't be rude, but you shouldn't be afraid of being called rude. And that means if somebody's doing something that you think is disastrous, there's only two cures. And one of them is to argue with them, and the other is to shoot them. And 
And arguing with them is a lot better. <laughs> You ready? Yeah. Question to the speakers, right? Sir, you're, uh, you get, got a lot to say there, but there's one concern I have. Right now, if you speak up, you stand alone. Uh, and that's a very dangerous place to be because our government can just grab you up. So what do we do? Well, first of all, I envy that beard. Uh, I bet you get a lot of girls. <laughs> Just one. You got one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I got. Um, it's not the same one, I don't think, though. Uh, so the, the th thing is, yeah, in the beginning, but, you know, last summer... I mean, I'm afraid it's gonna be as bad this summer. Last summer, all these events started unfolding, and I think that they're connected. I think that the pandemic policies, which I think are absurd and have cost many lives, whereas if we'd identified and focused on the people, that's what the Great Barrington Declaration calls for, right? And it just seems so sensible to me, especially if you take into account the fact that people shouldn't have to shut their businesses and you know, stay home, and you have the right to assemble. What about that? Anyway, and then that led to the, you know, then the race riots, and then the election. And you know, those are violent things and terrible things, and the pressures were enormous. And so Doug Jeffrey, who's external affairs at the college, and my longest serving colleague, pity him, <laughs> what do we do on Imprimus except the pandemic and the race riots, and the election. And nobody else was doing that. And, you know, so I thought, okay, we're gonna be destroyed. We did it anyway. And, and that, you know, but million, you know, I, 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 I could give you a list of the code. So in, we got, a, you know, everybody got petitions up, social media movements that you have to make a statement. And we, you know, so we had a bunch of them do that. And we don't answer statements. If somebody gives me a petition, before I open it, I say, well, I'll read this if you want me to, but I promise, whatever you're asking me to do, I'm going to do the opposite. Do <laughs> you want me to read it? Anyway, and we don't answer them, right? Well, I got ticked off about the one about Black Lives Matter. The thing that got me was they said they were coasting on the experience of the founders of the college. And we've got to stop talking about them now. So we answered that. And, it, you know, we, David Whalen, most, he's a very talented man. He wrote most of that. And it was awesome, and they printed it in the Wall Street Journal. And then I had college presidents from all over the country write me and praise that. And every time I thought, and where were you? <laughs> so the point is, Somebody has to start. I'm a Hillsdale grandparent, so uh, this is my first time to be here. But I was a classroom teacher for 41 years. Mm -hmm. A teacher, not an educator. I really get tired of everybody being described as educators. I feel like I was a teacher. And that's all I ever wanted to do was teach chemistry. I yeah. loved my students. You just, you just said a lot of information about yourself. Well, I want to know what's your opinion about what educators versus teachers, since you describe yourself as a teacher. We're all teachers. My dad was a teacher. Yeah, you know, you, by the way, you know what the verb that they use for teaching in the bureaucratic, in, in the core curriculum, in, the, in all curriculum talk, uh, teaching is called delivery. You see, and that's, the point is, teachers are now like conveyor belts. Uh, there's a, somebody prepares a package, you don't really even have to know what's in it. Just take it down there and give it to that guy. 
That's, that's the, the model. And it's devastating and it's demeaning. Do you ever watch... Uh, uh, so in, in the great Western movies, there's often a school teacher. And the cowboys take their hats off when they go in the school. And they're polite around the teacher. And the teacher is a symbol of wisdom in the society and often functions in the film to supply, supply knowledge, right? Like, we always had girls at Hillsdale College, and you know, you had to know Greek and Latin to get into the college back then. Our standards have slipped. <laughs> and, uh, and they had a prep school to teach those things. What happened to those women? They all became teachers of their families and everybody in their region, and they functioned as the wisest people and most knowledgeable people on the scene, right? Well, now they're delivery boys and girls, and that's just devastating demotion. And you know, some of them, we notice, uh, if you want to get a job at Hillsdale College, do not ever manifest this point. Some of them take pride that they wrote curricula that other people had to follow. And you know, we write curricula for, that you know, 15 or 20,000 students are studying all the time, but we write it with the teachers. So yeah, good point. Question to the speakers, right? Hi, Dr. Arn. I'm a homeschool mom of seven, and my first three are at Hillsdale. And mm -hmm. What is your name? <laughs> Wendy Moody. Oh, Moody, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I threw those three out. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why. Yeah. <laughs> I did too. Yeah. <laughs> but homeschooling is a countercultural thing to do and very difficult. So my question is, what would you say to encourage the homeschool movement? Oh, man. Now, is Dan Peters here, the trustee? You in the room, Dan? Good. I was going to praise him. Um, <laughs> he, he, uh, so I just learned something exciting. First of all, we're going to do curriculum and video t and helps for homeschoolers. We're starting to work on that now. And, and you know, I'm uh, ignorant. And so I never, I never heard of this, but in Hillsdale, Michigan, there's a co-op, and that's a bunch of homeschool moms. They're mostly faculty moms, by the way. They teach part-time at the college, some of them. And they get together and they form a little school with the kids in their families. And now I've just learned that I have another employee. I'm gonna hire her husband, too. Uh, I decided the other day. And they're in a group of 50 in Jackson, up the road. So, don't you see, I, I think, here's my excited, excited idea, that's, in fact, what all schools used to be, right? And you know, you, you don't, uh, people with the will, who are reasonably intelligent, can build and run a great school. If they get help, it's better, and we help them. But there's no reason that in K through 12, let's say K through nine, there's no real reason why you need an administration in a school. And so, yeah. And, and you know, in Hillsdale we find that the Homeschoolers, uh, you know, first of all, you know, it's hard to get into Hillsdale. And uh, uh, so it's, the success rates are very high. Uh, back when there was more failure than there is now, the homeschoolers stood out because they never failed. And why? I think, uh, uh, you know, one of the challenges when you get to college is there's a lot more work and it's harder and you've got to concentrate for longer. And, you know, homeschoolers are mostly taught by mom and she's busy. They have to learn on their own a lot. And I think that's good for them. Yeah, so I encourage that very much. 
Please oh. join me in thanking Dr. Arn. Mm.